Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the MIT Career Lunch and Learn webinar series. My name is Ellen Stahl. I run the alumni career programs here at the Alumni Association and will serve as host and moderator for today's workshop. Our webinar is being broadcast live, and we will be collecting questions from you throughout the presentation. Please type your questions in the chat box on the lower right side of the WebEx window. This webinar is being recorded, and we will be uploading the webinar and have it available to view online within a week from today on our YouTube channel. A few technical notes about the webinar. We hope to have approximately 250 people in our online audience today. And due to that large group, you're all muted. You can only ask questions via the online chat box provided. If you can see the presentation but cannot hear the audio, try using the dial, um, dial in option on your phone to hear the audio portion. And I'm going to put that into the chat box and post that right now for you. Our presentation today is What Works for Women at Work? Four Patterns Working Women Need to Know. This webinar is scheduled from 12 to 1. We will hear from our presenter until about 1245-ish, at which time we will open up to questions and answers um, in that portion of the program. Please type your questions into the chat box at any time during the webinar today. You don't need to wait until that portion of the program. Before we get started, it is my pleasure to introduce you today to our presenter. We are extremely fortunate to have with us Joan C. Williams. Joan has played a central role in reshaping the conversation about women and work over the past quarter century. Joan, an alumna of the class of 1980 at MIT, earned a master's in city planning and currently is a distinguished law professor and founding director of the Center of Work-Life Law at the University of California, Hastings. Described as having something approaching rock star status by the New York Times, she's authored eight books and over 90 academic articles and book chapters including Deconstructing Gender, 1996, one of the most cited law review articles ever written. She lectures widely and is joining us today to discuss her latest book, What Works for Women at Work, Four Patterns Working Women Need to Know. Joan, welcome, and thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. I hand it over to you. Uh, good morning. Delighted to do something for MIT. I'm going to talk to you today about the book that I published with my daughter, Rachel Dempsey, called What Works for Women at Work. And you can see there from the quote that our goal is to provide women with concrete strategies for navigating through environments shaped by subtle gender bias. Sorry, having, OK, here we go. Um, I'm going to talk about three different things today. I'm going to focus on individual strategies that women can use in their day-to-day -day activities. Um, I'm also going to talk a little bit about individual bias interrupters, what you can do individually to help interrupt bias, to help yourself, but also others. And then I will introduce briefly the concept of institutional interrupters the idea of what your organization can do to redesign its basic business systems to interrupt bias. All of this stems back to work that I began about five years ago, where I just began reciting the findings of experimental social psychologists on gender bias and asking highly successful women, this is what the studies show, any of that sound familiar? To my uh, astonishment and dismay, 96% of the women I interviewed reported having encountered one or more of the basic patterns of gender bias. And you see that there are four set out below. And you also see that women experience these different four patterns in different, at different levels. And we'll talk about more about that in a minute. Let's, talk, let's jump right into the first pattern. We call it Prove It Again. And as you can see, 68% of the women we interviewed reported it. We subsequently did a study of women in STEM, women science professors, and about 66% of them reported it. So that seems to be a pretty robust number. 
the first mechanism stems from what social psychologists call lack of fit. You see two photos there. They're actually of the same person, now named Ben Bars. He's a neuroscientist at Stanford. And he said, you know, some people even think my research is better. Shortly after I changed sex, a faculty member said, Ben Bars gave a great seminar today, but then his work is much better than his sister's work. Well, of course, they were the same person. But Ben fit the image, the automatic image most people have of the brilliant scientist, whereas Barbara didn't. And so Ben's work was literally judged better based on because uh, he seemed to fit that automatic image better. Again, having trouble. Um, OK, here we go. <clears throat> the, uh, the, this, for this second mechanism is called in-group favoritism. And that stems from people's social networks. Now, the most important factor in determining social networks, as you see, is um, is similarity. So the single thing that determines people's social networks is that they tend to choose people who are similar to them. That's the in-group favoritism effect. Um, Ellen, I'm having a tremendous amount of trouble um, advancing the slides. Do you have any advice? Well, I will. I will proceed. Um, okay. I could try for you. <laughs> um, okay. Um, well, I'll try. Uh, the in-group favoritism has three major effects. The first is sponsorship. A sponsor is someone who's willing to spend their political capital for you. And sponsors tend to choose people in their networks. In other words, people like them. For industries that have predominantly men at the top, and that's most industries that has an obvious negative effect for women. People in the in-group also get information, informational advantages. They tend to hear the inside scoop. And finally, people in the in-group tend to be given the benefit of the doubt. So here's an example of that. Um, Ellen, could you please advance the slides from here on out? I'm unable to do so. I'll say next slide. Yep, they're advancing from our side. Oh, oh, they're not advancing from mine. OK. Here's an example uh, of the lack of fit effect. This is someone who was a rainmaker, someone whose job it was to bring in clients. She said, you know, I was constantly told, you have the network, but you don't have the work whereas a man could just take clients out to dinner or golfing. He was given credit for that. So you notice how the man is being judged on his potential to get clients, but the woman hasn't, actually has to deliver. Next slide, please. All set. Um, so women need to be judged. Uh, women actually need to be more competent than men in order to be judged equally competent. Next slide. Yep. OK, my slides are not advancing. <clears throat> um, excuse me, I'm, I'm going to I'm getting, to Yeah, I'm getting chats that people are saying that they're, they're seeing it. OK. Um, here's another prove it again effect. The cartoon, which is a punch cartoon, says, this is an excellent suggestion, Ms. Trigg. Perhaps one of the men here would like to make it. This is what my daughter and co-author Rachel calls the stolen idea. A, man, a woman mentions an idea. It's kind of glossed over. A man repeats it. And um, suddenly, it's recognized. Uh, this is a, an effect of what's called confirmation bias, of, bias. It's an effect of lack of fit that, again, the women, you don't expect the, stolen, the, the brilliant idea from the woman. Um, could you advance the slide? Yep. Another prove it again effect is the coding of successes. Um, women's successes often are attributed to, to, to luck, men's to skill. 
So of course women need to have more successes than men in order to be seen as equally competent. Women's mistakes are often coded differently than men. Women, their mistakes tend to be noticed more and remembered longer. Again, a lack of fit effect. In addition, people in the in-group tend to have requirements applied leniently to them, whereas people in the out-group, here women, tend to be, have requirements applied in a rigorous way. And this is actually from an online game I created called Gender Bias Bingo, where a woman scientist ordered lab equipment in exactly the way she'd seen men do it, and she was roundly chewed out for not following the rules. She said, wait a minute, I just saw six men doing that way, but another classic effect. How does all of this differ by race? There you see a picture of the Double Jeopardy report, <clears throat> which examines how the experience of gender bias in STEM differs by race. The simple answer is that black women are much more likely than women from any other group to report prove it again problems. 77% of black women reported them, as we saw the number was more like 66% for women in general. Could you advance the slide, please? Yep, all set. Unfortunately, OK, here we go. OK, so here are some of the strategies for dealing with Prove It Again. First, some bias interrupters. Say you're sitting in a room and you see men being judged on their potential, women on their performance. You can just say mildly, you know, I think we finally realized what we're looking for here. We're looking for someone with A, B, and C. Let's go back to the bottom, to the top of the pile and make sure we've picked up everybody who has all of those requirements. So you can interrupt bias without necessarily calling it out openly or spending a lot of political capital. Next slide, please. Yep. Okay. I don't see it yet. Geez, you know, I've given scores of webinars and I've never had this problem. I just said the slides are not advancing. Okay. Um, what if you see that stolen idea? Um, you can just say very mildly, um, you know, I've been pondering that idea ever since Pam first said it. You've added something important. Maybe here's the next step. Again, you can interrupt bias without spending a lot of political capital. Then we come to the individual strategies. For women, it's very important um, not to internalize this bias. For example, if there are nine requirements for promotion, women often will wait until they have all nine. Men will tend to go up when they have 60% of the requirements. So bottom line, you have to operate a little bit outside your comfort zone. Next slide. Um, it's also important if you think about it, if people are going to tend to remember your failures and overlook your successes, you have to be ready to remind them. So it's very important to keep careful real-time records of all objective metrics met. What if you get, next slide, a compliment? If it's in, a, um, in, in, in an email, you respond, say thank you very much for that compliment. It really made my day. And then you forward the compliment to people that you're close to, people who are your sponsors or allies. Next slide, please. Um, OK, still not. Still not advancing. Do you see the next slide advance? Getting information. Yep. OK. Unfortunately, I don't. OK, here we go. Finally. What if you get a verbal compliment? Um, if you get a verbal compliment, then um, go back to your office, write the person a thank you email saying, when you said X, really made my day and then forward that to your mentors, sponsors, and allies. 
If for getting information, it's important to network inside your office to establish that professional network, keeping in mind that you may have to work harder to do that than, uh, than the men do because of this in-group favoritism effect. The second of the four patterns we call the tightrope. And as you can see, it's the most common pattern. About three-fourths of women report it. It stems from prescriptive stereotypes. Women are expected to be nice and communal, helpful, modest, and interpersonally sensitive. Men are expected to be competent and agentic, assertive, direct, competitive, and ambitious. And just in my email this morning, I noticed a new study saying that these stereotypes have not changed in 30 years. The result of those prescriptive stereotypes is that women often have to choose between being liked but not respected. That's if they conform to those feminine stereotypes, help, helpful, modest, defacing, and nice. Or respected but not liked. That's if they conform to those two masculine, um, to those, the masculine stereotypes, direct, assertive, competitive. And so you find women often find themselves walking a tightrope between being seen as too masculine to be likable or too feminine to be competent. One of the ways that these prescriptive stereotypes work out is that men tend to interrupt women more than vice versa. That's because it's seen as more socially appropriate in a man to interrupt women. He's showing he's competitive and ambitious. If a woman does it, wait a minute, she's not being modest and self-effacing. Who does she think she is? So Ben Bars, the, um, the trans man neuroscientist, said, you know, now I can co even complete a whole sentence without being interrupted by a man. Another tightrope pattern is that women often feel pressure to behave in feminine ways, pressure to be the office mother or the peacemaker or the dutiful daughter. They also often feel pressure to engage in what's called organizational citizenship behavior. Women do more of it, and they get less credit for doing it. This is what Rachel calls doing the office housework. There are four different kinds of housework. The first is literal housework, planning parties, cleaning up after a meeting. Second is administrative work. Who schedules the meeting, um, does things that are undervalued, like running the summer program, or doing the billing. Third is emotion work. She's upset. Can you fix it? Often seen uh, that women have a taste and talent for that. And undervalued work versus glamour work. Whatever is the routine back office work, women are often seen as having a taste and talent for it. And you see in law firms, it's recruiting, talent management, doing uh, a closing checklist or a litigation task list. This varies from industry to industry, but what doesn't vary is whatever is the routine, undervalued back office work, women are seen as particularly suited to it. On the other hand, if you're direct, outspoken, assertive, or competitive, then this is often what happens. If you're stern or you say no, the immediate reaction is to call that woman a bitch, right? If you're a man, it's just a no. And you can see what's happened in both of those cases. The woman is being penalized for not conforming to that image of the good woman as modest, self-effacing, nice, always attuned to others' comfort levels and not putting herself forward. Anger is also a key danger point for women. Showing anger tends to decrease the perceived status of a woman, but increase the perceived status of a man. This actually stems from studies of Bill Clinton when he was in office, showing that when he showed anger, people thought more highly of him. But when a woman shows anger, quite the opposite often happens. Same thing with self-promotion. Self-promotion that's often seen as appropriate in men is seen as inappropriate in women. So here this quote stemmed from a leadership academy that my center runs here in San Francisco. This was from a women law firm partner 
who found out that she was being paid about $200,000 less than a male law firm partner who she thought was pretty equivalent to her. So she did what she was supposed to do. She went to a member of the comp, comp committee with her objective metrics. She kept good records and said, I want to familiarize you with what kind of year I had last year. I brought in this client and I grew this client from X to Y. And the comp committee member uh, said, you think highly of yourself, don't you? Push back for self-promotion. How did these patterns, these tightrope patterns, differ by race? Well, they differ pretty dramatically by race. Asian American women report both sharply higher rates of pressure to behave in feminine ways and sharply higher rates of pushback if they don't. Asian American women report a partic particularly issues around surrounding anger. Showing anger is often even more costly for them than it is for other women. And if they behave in assertive ways, often they're seen as angry, even if, as one scientist told us, I wasn't angry, I just wasn't deferential. OK, here's some individual strategies for tightrope. First important message is that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. If what you're doing is not presenting problems, then can absolutely continue on. But if people don't take you seriously, if you're getting stuck with the office housework, or if you're getting pushed back on the grounds that you're abrasive, for example, here are some strategies to try. First, with respect to the office housework, the first important message is don't volunteer for this stuff. Um, you may be under strong informal pressures to do so, if you feel in a context where you have to volunteer, then do it once, do it graciously, and then work behind the scenes to set up a rotation so that that kind of work is passed around among people at a certain level. Also, if you have, feel you have a really heavy load of office housework, use the strategy we call the strategic no. The strategic no entails going out and getting yourself some highly valued glamour work. And then when the next office housework assignment comes around, you say, I would love to do that, but unfortunately, I'm working with Phil on this major strategic initiative. So um, that might be a good stretch assignment. And then suggest somebody else for whom it actually would be a good stretch assignment. The, the third office housework strategy is to make it work for you. For example, I spoke to one woman who'd actually been, this was years ago, assigned to the committee to put on the office cotillion. And she used it as a way of studying political relationships within the firm and beginning her career as a power broker, which later led to her being managing partner of the entire law firm. How about those, some of those two feminine conversation patterns that send the message you're too modest and self-effacing. And when you can't get a word in edgewise because the men are interrupting. Here's one thing a woman's mentor told her. He said, you know, when he's almost done speaking, you start to make your point. And if he doesn't stop, you just say, oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were done. That's a good example of what I call gender judo. And I'll talk more about that in a minute. This is another too feminine problem. You notice the stance of the woman on the left. She looks very unsure of herself. She also looks quite feminine. Um, the, way, the studies show that the way to display confidence are think Wonder Woman, feet firmly planted, weight evenly distributed, um, looking, holding your, your shoulders and your head level. That's the way, actually, I call that doing the Don Draper. That's a traditionally masculine pose, but it's also a pose that projects power in every primate. The pose on the left is a pose that projects lack of confidence and submission on the part of every primate. Here's more gender judo. This is actually a tech executive. When I asked her, like, well, do you ever have problems of being seen as too abrasive? She said, oh, here's my strategy. I'd be warm as mother 95% of the time, so that the 5% of the time <clears throat> when you need to be tough, you can be. 
And I don't recommend that you be warm Ms. Mother 95% of the time, unless you're the CEO. Um, but what gender judo is, is embracing one of those feminine stereotypes that typically holds women back, here the office mom, but flipping it around to propel your career forward by using it to balance the masculine and the feminine in order to avoid that what a witch stereotype that unfortunately women often, too often still face. Here's more gender judo. It concerns negotiating starting salary. Now you may have heard that women who negotiate, and women don't negotiate as much as men, but you may not have heard why. Women who do negotiate tend to be disliked and may be less likely to be hired. But there's literally a study that shows how women should negotiate for starting salary, and it's different from the way that men often have to do so. For men, a very effective strategy is just to say, I have a competing offer, here it is. For women, that tended not to work. Now sometimes it will work, often it won't. Here's something that won't work, well, that will work when that traditionally masculine strategy won't. You can say, you know, it wasn't clear to me whether this represents the top of the pay range. I don't know how typical it is for people at my level to negotiate salary, but I'm hopeful you will see my skill at negotiating is something important I can bring to the team. In other words, I'm just a good team player. Fitting into that feminine prescriptive stereotype of the modest, self-effacing team player. Then my mentor stressed how important it was for me to negotiate if there's a pay range. He also stressed, I should say, I would like to be eligible for an end of year bonus. There you can see the dutiful daughter stereotype, but in this case, it's being used, it's being deployed in a way to negotiate for starting salary while avoiding potential pushback for being seen as too masculine, not, that, not modest, self-effacing, and nice. How about self-promotion? There are two strategies for self-promotion. First is to round up a posse. A posse is is a group of people about at your level or maybe one notch above, and you celebrate each other's successes. So again, modest, self-effacing, and nice. You're celebrating someone else's success, but meanwhile, they are celebrating yours. And the most effective way is to round up a posse of men as well as women, uh, uh, whites as well as people of color. You can also, if you're leading a team, praise your team. Now make it clear you led the team. But um, praising your team is another way if you feel that you need to self-promote, but you feel that there's pushback for doing so. There's literally a, um, a formula for getting angry from one of the studies. If I look angry, it's because I am angry, because you've jeopardized. And then insert shared business goal here. You need to give an outside attribution. I'm being angry because you're jeopardizing our shared goal. I'm not in a rational um, id. Here are the organizational interrupters surrounding performance evaluation. This has to do with how your organization can redesign its business processes to interrupt bias. We have a bias climate survey. We have a worksheet that can be handed out with your performance evaluation. We, have, we will soon have a free online workshop. We have resources to help your organization define, uh, design its evaluation form to interrupt bias, also to design its evaluation processes to interrupt bias. <clears throat> we have workshop. You can have a workshop at your organization. There are train the trainers workshops in San Francisco. All of that is through the working group on bias interrupters. The web page will soon be launched at www.biasinterrupters.com. Um, how, does, how do these issues differ by race? Um, again, they differ substantially, but I've talked about that and don't have time for more. Uh, maternal wall, 59% of the mothers reported it, so it's less common, but if reported, it's also um, stronger. Motherhood triggers the strongest form of gender bias. This was a study that gave people identical resumes, one but not the other a mother. The mother was 79% um, less likely to be hired, only half as likely to be promoted. 
and offered $11,000 less in salary. These were management consultants. Also held to higher performance and punctuality standards. This is very, very strong bias. Mothers who are indisputably competent and committed, for example, working long hours, often are seen as less likable and held to higher performance standards. This is the tightrope for mothers. This is called benevolent bias. Um, some One woman heard that she wasn't given a career-enhancing assignment because the guy in charge said, you know, I knew it wasn't a good time for you because with those two small kids, so I just didn't even go there. You notice that even though the tone is benevolent, the message is clear, a good mother wouldn't want this assignment. Women without children also encounter the maternal wall. <clears throat> this is Janet Napolitano when she was being um, nominated for Homeland Security. One senator said, you know, Janet's perfect for the job. Because for that job, you have to have no life. Janet has no family. Perfect. She can devote literally 19, 20 hours a day to it. And the idea that women without children are, this is really a, version of the a modern version of the pathetic spinster stereotype. Women without children report working the longest hours in any group in the entire workforce, and this is why. Okay, here are some strategies. First, a bias interrupter. If you have a career enhancing assignment for someone, for example, who's just come back from maternity leave, or for that matter, uh, paternity leave. What the right thing to do is to call them into your office and say, I have this assignment. It would be the next step for you in your career, and I believe that it's the perfect assignment for you. But, you know, if it's not a good time for you, just say so. These things come around from time to time. And then make sure that person is given another opportunity. Here are some individual strategies. The first is just a piece of advice. There are a million ways to be a good mother and no way to be a perfect one. You need to really get over that internalized stereotype of the perfect mother inside, inside yourself. And I say as someone who's raised two wonderful children, um, the surest way to be a not very good mother is to insist to yourself and others on being a perfect mother. No one can. When you're asking for workplace flexibility, use your negotiation skills. Make the business case that this is something that can work for your team. Don't focus on why you need the flexibility. Focus, focus on the business case and why it will, how it will work very precisely. Also, when you return for maternity leave, if you're willing to travel, say so. If you're the primary earner, say so. If your partner is willing to follow you, say so. Because if you don't, people will make all the opposite assumptions. What if somebody tells you something like, oh, you know, I don't know how you can work such long hours. My wife could never leave her kids like that. You simply smile sweetly and say, you know, I'm sure that's right for her and your family, but this is what's right for me and my family. Here's the final pattern. It's called the tug of war. And as you can see, it's the least common. 55% of the women interviewed reported it. Again, like the maternal wall, though, it can be very strong once triggered. First of all, it doesn't always happen. 75% of the scientists we surveyed reported that the older women are always very encouraging, very helpful, very kind to me. They said that women in their environments generally supported each other. But here's where the problems come in. One woman said, you know, opportunities for women here, they're very zero sum. If one woman gets a prized position, another woman won't. And so it breeds a sense of competition. This is often called the problem of the queen bee, but it's really not attributable to the personality problem of an individual woman. It's really the result of gender bias in the environment. Studies show that women who have encountered discrimination early in their careers tend to distance themselves from other women. And here's the CEO of Yahoo describing this when she was at Google. She said, I'm not a girl at Google. I'm a geek at Google. And you notice how adeptly she identifies with 
the in-group geek and distances herself from the out-group girl. This is often why many women, uh, sometimes, not many, but sometimes older women or women in general distance themselves from, for example, women's initiatives or perhaps from other women in general. Sometimes you have the other three patterns of gender bias being passed through from woman to woman. And sometimes this happens between women and support staff. This is a legal secretary saying female lawyers are harder on their female assistants, more detail-oriented, and they have to try harder to prove themselves. So they put that on you. And you notice how the woman lawyer is feeling prove-it-again pressure, and that's creating conflict with her secretary. This study of about 150 legal secretaries found that not one preferred to work for another woman, although it's important to recognize half didn't have a preference. But among those with a preference, every single one preferred to work with men. This is part of the reason why. Tightrope bias is also passed through, and it creates what Rachel calls generational issues. <clears throat> Here's a young woman professor. She said, I'm kind of on a backlash mission. I wear dresses, I bake cookies for my group meetings, I bring my child to class. I'm not going to compete as a boy because I'm a boy. You notice how she's responding and saying that the older women tended to just act like men, and I'm not going to do that. In other words, she's criticizing older women for being too masculine. Older women sometimes return the compliment and criticize the younger women for being too feminine. Sometimes this works out in a pass-through of the maternal law. Women who often, my age, often older women often say, you know, I worked long hours my whole career and my kids are fine. I don't know why the younger women need that long parental leave or to go part-time. Child-free women, women who never wanted children, sometimes say, you know, the mothers are just reinforcing stereotypes. Um, or childless women, women who wanted children but never had them, said, you know, I had to make hard choices. I don't know why she, she should have it all. So that's different choices around motherhood, creating conflict among women at work. There are, I'm happy and sad to report that there are few differences by race. The maternal ball bias affects women of every race. OK, um, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I forgot, I'm in tug of war. So there are differences by race when it comes to tug of war. Black women are much less likely to report that other women in their environment support each other. Only 56% of black women did. As you remember, 75% of women in general did. OK, here's some strategy. First of all, if there are conflicts among women in your environment, ask yourself, are they a symptom of gender bias? Now, of course, some women do have personality problems. Some men have personality problems. That's just part of being part of the human race. But often, these are not reflecting personality problems. These are reflecting strategic behavior by women in a context of gender bias. It's also important to recognize the limits of sisterhood. After all, do men always support men? Of course they don't. And we don't call them bitches when they don't. We just, uh, so the assumption that women will always support other women is really, in some ways, reflecting that stereotype of women, modest, self-effacing, nice team players. Some women are ambitious and more power to them. Senior women need to remember that younger women's experience is simply different. Really, that's what we worked for. So a broader range of women could enter these traditionally male careers. But that also means that the younger generation is going to be quite different than the, young, than the older one, maybe more traditionally feminine in a whole series of ways. Younger women, though, need to remember that senior women may not be helping you as much as you think they should, because they may not have as much power as you think. One of the things I expected when I undertook this research is that these highly successful senior women who I was speaking with would report that they might have had experience with gender bias early in their careers, but, but that now 
it really wasn't really a factor. That's not what I found. Many of the women reported that they were encountering all of the patterns, even prove it again throughout their careers. Okay, I look forward to your comments and questions. We run an organization, a membership program called Women's Leadership Edge. Um, so, Ellen, let's. I look forward to the question. Joan, thank you so much. That was really interesting, um, enlightening, uh, validating on lots of levels for me personally. Thank you. Um, one of the questions uh, that has come in since we've been chatting um, that seemed to be a theme was, how does mentoring uh, a mentor come across as strong and self-sufficient? Um, now, is that, I'm, I'm a little confused by the question. Um, so how does, if you are the mentor, how do you come across as strong, as strong and self-sufficient, or how do you come across to a potential mentor? Um, that's a good question. Could we take it from either way? Maybe so so thinking of it as a mentee or a mentor? Um, the, the way that women who have trouble coming across as strong and self-sufficient often are having what I've called two feminine problems. They're following feminine traditions in a series of ways that's undercutting their ability to project credibility and confidence. For example, they may be using hedge words like don't you think or I wonder if rather than simply stating their ideas with quiet confidence. They may be using very sub submissive postures um, rather than, again, standing on both feet and just stating your ideas with, uh, with quiet confidence. So I think that is, those are some of the reasons why women sometimes come across as projecting less confidence than they should. And the, the bottom line here is, um, you know, don't ask, act arrogant. Again, what you're striving for is quiet confidence. But if you don't show confidence in yourself, why should other people show confidence in you? That is the touchstone. So this is a situation where you really do have to fake it till you make it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, here's another question from another participant. There's been some recent research showing that women co-authors on scientific papers often aren't given their full share of credit for the publications. Is solo work and publishing the best option, or do you have other suggestions for ensuring um, that people receive, women receive adequate credit for their shared work? Yeah, there was a study, a recent study of <laughs> excuse me, by a young woman economist that was um, shocking but not surprising, showing that women in economics who author, co-author papers, those papers don't tend to help their ten tenure chances, whereas when men did the same, they tended, those same co-authored papers tended, tended to help the tenure chances of both of the male co-authors. Um, this is, it's, it really depends on your field whether single authorship is a practical option. Um, in some science fields, co-authorship is inevitable. But if, given that study, if you have a choice between being a co-author and being a single author, unfortunately, until at least until you're tenured, um, it is the study suggests that you should go for single authorship. Now, and that's just a good example of how it's different navigating these careers as a woman than as a man. I would also say, though, if you really, there's a study that you want to do that is really only logical as a co-authored study, another thing you could do is negotiate to be first author with your co-authors and just say, you know, the research shows that women are disadvantaged in these kinds of contexts and that men aren't. Um, so that's a, another thing you could do. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, here is a question. Um, as a man in industry, do you have advice on how to proactively confront gender bias and effectively build strong teams for women while not coming off as patronizing? 
Um, I'm so grateful for that question, I have to say. Um, we actually have, through the Women's Leadership Edge, a webinar on bias interrupters for male allies. And what that workshop does, it's completely focused on exactly this issue of what managers can do to interrupt bias in the way they manage their teams and fully tap the potential of all members of their teams. There are some very low-key ways to do this, and I've mentioned a couple. Mm -hmm. the Advice up to this time has been, and this comes out of Google, of like, you know, if you see something, say something, of calling out the bias. I don't think that's often going to be politically feasible for many people, and I'm not even sure it's going to be most effective. I think what you need to do is to understand how bias operates and be able in deft, low-key ways to tweak what you're doing in order to interrupt the bias. And that's exactly what the evidence-based approach that my center has developed seeks to do. Great. Um, there seem to be, and I think you've touched a, a lot upon it, so I'm going to try to sort of put this into one question as a theme. Um, how do you deal with women in leadership positions, female managers and supervisors that are more critical to subordinate women um, than they are to subordinate men with the attitude that they feel that they have, that they've had to pay their dues as a woman to make it to the top, and now you do as well? This is a classic tug-of-war problem. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes also women hold each other to higher standards on the grounds that, you know, quote, that's what it takes to succeed here as a woman. So sometimes it's like, I paid my dues, you have to pay your dues. But sometimes it's that pass-through of prove-it-again prove it bias as well. Uh, I think the bottom line is in that it's very important to realize that gender isn't only about women. Men, suffer, men face gender pressures too. And also the allies that you can seek in trying to navigate successfully through these patterns of bias, often they're going to be men, as we just said, not, not women, or men and women. And so in that kind of context, if you're in a context where the leader is someone who inadvertently, no doubt, basically is systematically disadvantaging women, my advice is to steer clear of her and to go find somebody else, either a woman who is interested in championing other women, or a man who is interested in champion, championing women, or simply tapping the full talent pool, and to make an alliance with someone else instead. One other thought before we go. One thing that younger women can do, and it may work, it may not, but it's, it's I think, pretty much always worth a try, is just to communicate to that older woman you know, I really appreciate everything you've done in your career to make it possible for me to have my career. That may not work, but it may help improve the situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, more and more women are starting their own businesses and companies, and while they may not have the same um, organizational challenges that we've been discussing specifically, they do have other challenges such as fundraising, business development, et cetera. Are there any specific pieces of advice you would give for women as entrepreneurs? Well, there, there's, um, there's a study that shows that women entrepreneurs have a harder time raising money than male entrepreneurs do. Um, so I think that this is a classic prove it again situation where mm -hmm. uh, sad but true, often women need to nail it in terms of the presentation to VCs even more than men do. They need to show both vision and enthusiasm and, um, and wit and humor if possible. And they also need, they may need to provide more objective data than men do in order to, to get funded. Mm -hmm. uh, Women are, for a long, for many years, women have been founding their businesses at roughly twice uh, the rate of men. And many of the reasons that women found these businesses is to get better work-life balance and 
maintain in their uh, maintain their careers. So I would just say, you know, it's very challenging to found your own business, but that's the only route that many women feel is open to them because we continue to, to define the ideal worker in far too many professional jobs as someone who takes no time off for childbearing, takes no time off for child rearing, or really anything else and is available to work 60, 80 hours a week. That doesn't fit with many people's ideals of motherhood. I think the hopeful thing is it doesn't fit increasingly with many men's ideals of fatherhood. And I think that may finally move major organizations in the direction of change. Hmm. I'm just reading one question here that I'm that I'm sort of surprised by, but you probably have better information on. Um, there is a body of research literature discussing women bullying each other in healthcare, where women are often in the majority. What recommendations do you have for women working in such environments? I'm actually not familiar with that body of literature, um, and I, but I, I assume that's part of this tug of war pattern. Mm -hmm. I don't know much about it, um, so I don't know whether it stems from, um, I mean, one of the things that it might reflect, and I'm speculating here, first of all, it's so great to do this for MIT. Uh, nobody ever says, there's this body of literature here, there's this body of literature there. <laughs> I love you, MIT. Um, so one of the things that it might reflect is that um, women, even in, in, in industries that are predominantly female, the people on top, well, they are predominantly male. And so women, if that's true, then women might feel they need to distance themselves from other women. They need to compete with other women in order to get, want to raise, to rise. Um, so I would suspect that this is a prove it again pattern. It may, I'm sorry, a, a classic tug of war pattern. Uh, it, that may, it may be that kind of um, room for only one and that one is going to be me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Again, if you have someone who's a bully, um, seek out someone else because um, dealing with a bully, unless you have a taste for facing off, um, is not going to be a career enhancing environment for you. And even if you do have a taste for facing off, sometimes the bully will end up respecting you but sometimes the bully, it will just make things worse. Do you find it's helpful for women in, in male heavy professions, maybe such as engineers and tech, if they're looking for posses that they might have to go outside of their specific company to find those posses? I, I think that it depends on what you're using your posse for. Mm -hmm. If you're using your posse to spread your own accomplishments, um, ideally that will be inside your organization. Um, and I, you know, I, there are a lot of good guys out there. Um, and there are a lot of guys, I think, who are genuinely concerned about some of the environments in tech. Frankly, there are a lot of guys who are disadvantaged by some of the environments in tech. Here, I think for, ex for of electronic gaming, for example, where Sometimes there's like sort of super macho posturing going on and a highly sexualized atmosphere. Now, many women are going to feel uncomfortable in that atmosphere. Many men are going to feel uncomfortable in that atmosphere because super macho posturing just isn't their way of being a man. So I think there's your posse. I also think it's very important, though, particularly if you're in an environment where there are very few women in sight, I think the, the, the basic instinct behind the question is that you need a network not only within your organization, you need a network outside of your organization. That is a very sound instinct. And for example, I'm currently in partnership with, with the Society for Women Engineers. That's a good example. They have a mentoring program. And I think that if you're a woman engineer or any, any environment where there are very few women, Getting involved with that kind of organization, particular one 
particularly one that offers mentoring from older people in your chosen profession is a very good career move. Well, I think that that's powerful advice, and we might uh, take a moment just to let people know that um, Joan is um, offering us a discount code today for anyone that might be interested in, if you haven't purchased already her book, um, you can do that through www.newyorkuniversitypress.com um, and there is a 20% off coupon if you use the discount code Women at Work. Joan, thank you so much for sharing um, this information with us today and for all of your amazing research that you did with your daughter on this work. Uh, and the book, and um, can't thank you enough for for bringing that uh, to the community uh, today. Sorry again for the technical trouble. It always seems to be what what challenges us, but glad we were able to get through it. Thank you so much. Thank you. My pleasure. Bye, everyone.